the tangent problem. So today we begin the real calculus. Uh, and so begins a very fun journey down the road of identifying what is a calculus problem, okay? So what is calculus? So calculus, if you want to summarize it very simply, and I'm not going to do a big intro to what calculus is right now. I'm going to dive into just doing calculus. But calculus is the mathematics of change, how things change over time. And the first half of calculus is about um, the rate of change, okay? Instantaneous rate of change. How fast is one variable changing with respect to another variable. The most uh, simple way to visualize that in the real world is to think in terms of driving down the road in your car, how fast are you going? Okay, we know that we can measure speed, that is the actual speed that you've gone, by asking how far did you travel divided by how long did it take you to get there. If I went to Lubbock, which is 45 miles away, and it took me 45 minutes to get there, okay, or exactly um, three-fourths of an hour, I would take 45 miles divided by three-fourths of an hour and find out that I went 60 miles per hour to get there on average, right? But you also have sitting in your dash of your car this little dial which is telling you exactly how fast you're going at every moment, okay? But if velocity is distance traveled over time that you took to travel, how could you possibly know how fast you're going at an instant if you haven't traveled any distance at all and no time has passed, right? And so calculus allows us to study rates of change, velocities at instantaneous moments. And then it turns out, on all the surprising turn of events, that the second half of calculus, if you inverse that problem and say, if I know the instantaneous rate of change, can I figure out things like how far did I travel or how long did I travel going backwards? That's the integral problem in calculus. Turns out to be related more to areas under curves than rates of change. So the reverse problem turns out to be all about areas. So the forward problem in calculus is how fast are we going? What's the rate of change with one variable with respect to the other? And then the reverse problem is what's the area underneath curves, right? So let's dive in now and talk about that first half of that problem, rates of change. So in order to talk about rates of change, first thing you got to remember from algebra is slope, right? Which I hope everybody happens to remember. When I ask you for the slope formula, what do you remember is the slope? And there may be variations that you have heard, but I'll take whatever you remember. Okay, so you remember, and I'm going to put this off to the side because it's not exactly what I want to write in the notes right there, but y equals mx plus b does come up in the context of talking about slope, okay? This is the equation of a line, okay, where this number right here is the slope, and this turns out to be the y intercept. So in algebra, when you learn y equals mx plus b, where y and x are the variables, then this is the formula for a line that has a slope m and a y-intercept b. What does slope mean in this? That's what I really wanted to ask down here. How do you find slope? Yes, sir. Okay, so change in y over change in x would be one way to write that. Delta is a commonly used symbol in mathematics to represent change. Okay, so if you want to write that out, you can actually say change in y over change in x. So a couple of things. It's a fraction, right? Um, another thing is you've got y on top and x on bottom, okay? Order matters there. You don't talk about change in x over change in y. You're thinking of y as the thing that depends on x. So it's the dependent variable and x is the independent variable. Have you heard it phrased with the word rise over run? So this is vertical change, right? And this is horizontal change. So for every unit horizontally, how far up or down do you go? If your slope is one, you can think of that as one over one, you go up one for every one to the right. You go up one for every one to the right, okay? And if your 
given two points, say, for example, you have a point here and a point here on the rectangular coordinate system, and this is x1, and this is y1, and this is x2, and this is y2, okay, then the line, that is a line, use your imagination, it's a line between those two points, has a slope, okay, that's the m, is the, the name of the variable we're giving to slope, is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And I would say that's the most important version that you need to remember. That's what m is. If you're talking about slope, it is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. I always like to think of it as the point that I ended up at minus the point that I started from. End minus beginning. Okay, now um, kind of related to what we saw up here, there is another formula you need to remember in this section in particular of how you find the equation of a line. That is, what is the point slope formula for the equation of a line? That is, usually this is the kind of question that you're asked in algebra that says, here's a point and here's the slope. What's the equation of that line? Okay, if you know a point and you know its slope, point slope. Actually, if you know two points, you can also get there because with two points, you can figure out the slope. But does anybody remember the point slope formula? Why? Oh, sorry. He raised his hand before you spoke, so I'm going to let uh, Alex back there. What was it? Y minus Y1 equals N times X minus X1 plus the B. No plus B, just like that. Because the, the B, the Y intercept, is taken into account in this that if your Y intercept, um, then your X is zero and your Y is Y1 is B. So, yes, it, it, it encapsulates that other one, which I know that's exactly what you were going to say. So we got it. We will use this later on. But what this means is that you can come up with an equation for a line if you have one of the points and if you have the slope. Okay? We'll do an example in a minute, but this is just from algebra. So let's fly forward. Actually, this is the example I wanted to do. Let's go ahead and find the equation of a line through two points. I forgot that I had an example right here for us. So if you're asked to find the equation of a line through two points, you got to know the slope. So how do we find the slope? We use yeah, the formula. I like to label it. This is x1, y1, x2, y2. So m is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So plug everything in negative three-fourths minus y1 is oh. you're, you're way ahead of me. I'm going slow. x2 minus x1 is 8 minus 1. All right, so negative three-fourths minus 1 on top. we got to do a little fraction arithmetic. What is negative three-fourths minus 1? Negative seven fourths, I heard somebody say. You can think of this as one over one, right? And the reason I do that is so I can find a common denominator, which is four. Negative three minus four is negative seven. And then you keep the same. So negative seven fourths over seven. And then to divide fractions, think of that as seven over one. I always was learned, taught to uh, invert multiply. My wife, who teaches high school calculus and algebra and trig and stuff like that, she always comes up with the cool mnemonics or has learned them. Things like copy dot flip. Anybody ever heard copy dot flip? I hadn't either, so we're in good company. But that means take the first, the top, and then dot, and then flip the bottom one seventh, right? and you get negative one-fourth because the sevens cancel. Okay, so it may be dusty upstairs doing fraction calculations, but I'm gonna fly through them and if you have questions, you can either stop me or ask me afterwards, that's fine. But that was how I would calculate it. So that's the slope. And then the second, I'm gonna use point slope, which is this formula we just right here had. And we can pick either point, but we're going to plug the point in for x1, 
y1, and then the slope that we just found. So we have um, y minus, and my y1 is 1, equals negative 1 fourth times x minus 1, which there it is in point slope form. Uh, generally, you'll be asked, um, you know, in the context of homework or a test in calculus, they may tell you what form they want the answer in. Um, the most commonly asked for form is the one we came up with earlier, y equals mx plus b. Okay, so if we wanted to simplify this and get it to y equals mx plus b form, we just got to do a little algebra and get y by itself. So if I were to solve it for y by distributing this across, I have y minus 1 equals negative 1 fourth x plus 1 fourth. And then if I add 1 to both sides to get y by itself, I have y is equal to negative 1 fourth x plus 5 fourths. So 1 fourth plus 1, or 4 over 4, is 5 fourths. All right, that's, that's old stuff. You should know that or have seen it not too far ago, and you've probably done it a lot by this point in your academic career if you're taking calculus, okay? Does that all look familiar? Give me a thumbs up. All right. So then, now that we know how to do lines with points, um, let's talk about the tangent line and how we figure out tangent line from secant lines. Tangent lines turn out to be the thing on the graph that represent instantaneous rates of change or instantaneous velocity. And we'll see that connection in a second. One example that I wanted to show you that I didn't get to in class last time, but I have time to do today, is uh, an example in the notes from last time that um, I talked about, but I didn't actually show you my cool little graph thing. Do you remember in section four of our review of algebra, I introduced you to a dude named E, okay? Um, the, it's called the natural exponential. What I didn't tell you is what's so special about him. First of all, he shows up everywhere in calculus, okay? If you were in a geometry class and I said, what's the most important number in all of geometry besides zero and one? In geometry, the answer is pi, because pi shows up all over the place in geometry, especially with circles and arcs and ellipses and things like that. 3.1415926 dot, 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 so on. But in calculus, if I ask you what's the most important number besides zero and one, the answer is E. And I will spend three semesters convincing you that E is a beautiful thing. Okay? He's very valuable in talking about derivatives. Okay? But what is E? Why is this a number that we care about? And so what is it actually defined as? And it has something to do with slopes. So I have a little uh, demonstration. Uh, uh, oh, because that is a picture. I'm just going to have to type that in. Well, that's annoying. Okay, anyway, give me a sec. Can't click the link, but I will bring it up in just a second. It is www.desmos.com. Who's heard of Desmos? A few of you? It's a very cool and easy to use um, graphing calculator for your browser. Oh. It did not bring up the one I wanted it to. Maybe I typed it wrong. I'll just log in. And go back to Desmos. Find mine, Scott. Uh, resources? No. Where's my stuff? I made one. Sure, I'll open that one. Okay, so I'm going to turn this off for a second. And the green line that you're seeing on the screen, you'll see that all right? I can make it darker if I need to. I think settings. Maybe not. All right, we'll just leave it as it is. Okay, so. What I've got graphed on the screen right here is y equals b to the x. So if I like move this slider to 2, then that graph right there is y equals 2 to the x, which makes sense. We know that exponential curves, if you go out to the left, right, are asymptotically approaching the, the x-axis, getting closer and closer to the x-axis. If you go out to the right, it's blowing up. And at, you know, 1, which is right here, it has a height 
of two. If I went over to two, zoom in a little bit, it's got a height of four, right? There's four right there. If I keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, then I get to three and there's y equal three dx. And if things go down smaller, then you know it gets more and more horizontal. If I go below one, it's going downhill. Which by the way, maybe helps you understand one of the confusing questions that you had on the homework. There was one problem that asked you for the range. That you asked me about this, you weren't the only one, but I remember you and I texting back and forth over this. The question was, what's the range of the exponential function v to the x when v is not one? And the confusing part was that you, you may think of v as the variable in that problem, and so you want your range to not include one. But what the question is really asking is, for all of these curves, right? no matter where I put this slider, Okay, with the exception of putting it at one, just don't put it at one, but for all of the other curves, no matter where I put the slider, what's the range of that function? Zero to infinity, right? And the reason one is excluded, oops, is that if I put it right at one, what's the range of that function? Exactly one number, just the number one, right? One to one, that's it. But all the rest of them have zero to infinity. So that question is asking for all of the curves, which one, you know, what's the range of those? But the next question is, I want to graph, right, the line that has a slope of one at the intercept y equals one. And why I'm doing this will come become clearer later on when we get to actually talking about derivatives. But can you find the b so that the green curve just touches that line but never crosses it, okay? So I can zoom in quite a ways right here. I'm going to adjust B so that the slope at that point of the green line matches the black line. And what's the slope of the black line, by the way? It's one, right? And it's about 2.7. If I were to increase my resolution and have much more decimal places, the number where the slope of b to the x is exactly 1 at x equals 0 is the number e, 2.718281828495 dot dot dot. That's the special number whose value as an exponential if you were to graph it e to the x the slope of the function e to the x at zero is exactly one okay so anyway what we're really talking about when we talk about the tangent line is exactly this concept that it is just touching it just skims the surface of the curve at that point but doesn't cross it okay and since i'm actually approximating i think i could probably zoom in far enough that i actually probably cross barely cross because I don't have the 1828 at the end, but it's I'm going pretty close. They're very, very close and not crossing, but if I you know bump it either way, boom, boom, I'm crossing it. So there's exactly one value that that's tangent for. Okay. So our goal then in this section, kind of our central problem as I've stated it here, is to find that tangent. So a tangent line in your notes is the line that just skims the graph at a point and don't let this notation confuse you too much but what this means is this is an ordered pair okay where the x value is a and the y value is the function value so find the point on that graph okay on that curve uh, we're going to call the tangent line, the line that skims that graph at that point without going through that graph at that point. And it comes from a Latin word, tangens, which means touching. So it just touches. So our central problem for the next several sections will be for a whole bunch of different types of functions, can we find the slope of the tangent line for a given point on a curve? Okay, so the approach we're going to use is the following. If a curve, right, this is a curve that we could graph, 
has a point, we'll call it P, but it's that A comma F of A. The X value is a chosen value A, and this means to find the height of the curve by plugging in the value A into the function. So say that's the point where we wanna find the tangent line slope and some nearby point. We're gonna go a little bit further away from it where X is sufficiently close to A. Then we can find the slope of the tangent line, PQ, as the slope between those two points. Okay, we're gonna find M sub PQ, which means the slope between those two points. Okay, so the slope of this line is gonna be called the sec, oh, sorry, I meant secant. Uh, mark that out, that should have been secant. The secant line goes through two points, the tangent line goes through one point. So we can find the slope of the secant line, PQ. And so secant means a line between two points. So tangent is a line between, or just touching one point and PQ. If we have two points, that's gonna be a secant line. So help you visualize this, let's draw this picture. So I'll do it over here. Draw maybe a curve that looks like this. And let's say this value right here is A, which means that this point right here has a height F of A. So I'm going to find it. I want to find the slope of the tangent line exactly at that point, a line that barely touches it. And so my approach is to find another point nearby. I can absolutely get closer than that, but just for drawing purposes, I'm going to pick an X over here and find the associated point on its curve that goes with X. So this height, this height right here is a height of f of x. So if you were to label this on the y-axis, this right here is f of a, and this up here is f of x, which makes these two points, points whose coordinates we know. This is a comma f of a, and this one up here is x comma f of x. Now you can use your notebook or another pen or something to draw a straight line. I'm gonna cheat and use my line tool right here. And I'm gonna draw a straight line. Maybe you'll let me choose it. I want that line to go exactly through those two points like that. So that would be called the secant line. Now if we knew all the values, we knew what f was, we knew what the, the a was, and we chose an x value, it's just a numerical calculation. So I'm doing this kind of in general right now, but this formula now is going to be, I'm going to write it I've got more space down here. So I'm going to write M sub PQ and I'm going to write down the slope of the line between those two points, the ending point minus the beginning point, right? So that's F of X minus F of A. That's the change in Y. That's Y2 minus Y1 over X minus A. And then eventually what we want to do is slide this X closer and closer to A and figure out what's the slope getting closer and closer to until they converge. Okay, and then the slope exactly at that point will be what this gets closer and closer to. Okay, 
So this idea of getting closer and closer and closer to is going to become what we spend most of our time doing in the next two class periods. They're called limits. But for now, let's just think of it uh, numerically, okay? Um, for now, um, well, I'll tell you, in, in the later sections of this chapter, I'm going to write this slope of the tangent line. is going to be, you still take f of x minus f of a over x minus a. But we're going to introduce something called limits and write this expression where I write LIM, which stands for limit, as x approaches a of this formula right here. Okay? And all this means is that we can go through this calculation above but we let X get closer and closer and closer to A without actually becoming A. Cool? Okay. So if we call the slope of the tangent line MT, then the, and I left out a word here, equation of the tangent line we can get from the point slope formula above. And it looks like this. So M is the, or M tan, the way I'm writing it right now, that's the slope of the tangent line. And then if I use the fact that my point is A comma F of A, then this is just the point slope formula with F of A plugged in for Y1, M, the slope of the tangent plugged in for M, and A plugged in for X1, right? You recognize that? That's just, I'm going to scroll up. That's just this guy right here with F of A here, A here, and the slope of the tangent line right there. So you may be asked to find the, the slope of the tangent line, or you may be asked to find the equation of the tangent line. Let's talk about how we find that slope first, and then we can come back and actually write the equation down. So here's an example. Let's consider a function y equals x squared. Very simple function. And we want to find the equation of the tangent line at the point 3, 9. If I went back to Desmos, for example, I could graph this curve, grab a new blank graph, and said y equals x squared, right? And at 3, 9, it's so over here, 3, up at 9, this point right there, right there close enough. 3, 9 is where I'm trying to find the, the tangent line. I want to find the equation of the tangent line right there. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by going one point away from 3, and I'm going to let my x be 4. And then if I plug 4 into this formula, I know that the height of the curve at x equals 4 is 16. So back at this graph, if I went over to 4, I'm at a height of 16. So I'm picking the point 3, 9 and 4, 16. I just want to know what's the slope of the line between those two points. Easy peasy, right? So the slope of the line through those two points is 16 minus 9 over 4 minus 3. Change in y over change in x, which is 7. Okay, so what I'm now going to do is I'm going to move from being, you know, I was at 3 and 4, I'm going to move closer, right? And now I'm going to be at 3 and 3.5. And I'm still looking at, you know, the curve above here. What's the secant line now for these two points that are closer together? So I've got to figure out then the slope of these two. Now on the first one, I was nice and I gave you the actual value of the function. On this one, I'm not being so nice. So you've got to do f of 3.5 minus 9 over 3.5 minus 3. So what's the function value at 3.5? You've got to plug it in to this guy, right? So 3.5 squared minus 9 over 3.5 minus 3. I think I did these. This is where you would want your calculator. 
for now, since I'm running low on time, I'm going to go ahead and just give you the number. I plugged that into my calculator and I got 6.5. I did uh, M is F of 3.1 minus 9 over 3.1 minus 3. I'm still doing Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1, and I get 6.1 when I do that. And I took this 3.1, and how did I get to 6.1? Well, I took 3.1 squared minus 9 over 3.1 minus 3, which gave me a, a 9.61 minus 9 over 0.1, which gave me 0.61 over 0.1, which was 6.1. I know I rushed through that, but I just want you to see where the pieces are coming from. Does it make sense what I'm doing? Okay. I mean, I'm, all I'm asking for is the slope between these two points, but I'm using a particular function to do it. And you start to see something happening here. If I do the same thing with the last one, and I pull out my calculator, I work the whole thing out, I got six, or seven, then I got 6.5, then I got 6.01, and then I got 6.01. So what does it look like is happening as I get closer and closer to three? What do you think the slope is getting close to? So we're going to make a guess at this point, okay? Or an estimate. That's our fancy word in mathematics for guess, okay? That the tangent is a slope of six. And then from that, we can figure out the tangent line. Right, this is the slope of the tangent. Now, how do we find the tangent line? Well, that's y minus, and what's the x value where we're finding the tangent? It was this first point all the way down. So the y value is 9 equals, and then what's the slope of the tangent line? It's the 6 we just figured out and then x minus the three. And so with a little bit of algebra and moving things around, that's six x minus 18. If you add nine to both sides, y is six x minus nine. This is the equation of the tangent line to the curve y equals x squared at x equals three. I can prove that that makes sense by going back to Desmos. If I type in y equals 6x minus 9, what do you see? It's a line that touches y equals x squared but never crosses it at that point right there. Isn't that cool? Okay. So we did all of this thinking in terms of um, graphs. Okay, and, and lines getting really close to graphs. Now, real-world tangents, I've already given you a model to think of, is the, the concept of velocity. So in general, suppose that you've got some object that's moving in a straight line, okay, and we know how far it's traveled at any given point time t by some formula. Um, examples that you'll see in homework may be things like throwing a ball off a roof. Okay, and ask what's the height at a given time. So I throw up with initial velocity and it's going to have a certain height based on how much time has gone by. That's your formula f of t. Okay, where s, okay, the actual output of that function is considered displacement, directed distance. How far has it traveled? So this directed means up is positive and down is negative. Or if I'm throwing forward and I'm measuring how far it went this way and my car is driving this way, how far have I traveled? That's directed displacement, okay? So the function f that describes that motion is sometimes called the position function. And motion along a straight line like this is sometimes called rectilinear, as in like rectangle. You know, like co rectangular coordinate system along a line, rectilinear motion. So 
instead of thinking in terms of A is my starting point and X is my next point, let's think in terms of time. I'm going to start at a certain time A, and then I'm going to let a certain amount of time go by. So A is like we're starting at three seconds, and then let's let half a second go by. Then I'm at 3.5 seconds. So the H is the how much time has gone by. So the displacement of a particle over time, how far has it traveled, can be thought of as the change in S, which is the function value at the end point, A plus H, minus the function value at the start time. Right, A is when we start, A plus H is when we end. If this was three seconds and H was 0.5, this would be 3.5 seconds. So you do the end minus the start. The end position minus the start position. Now, because these are directed distances, this value of displacement can be positive or negative, right? You could go backwards. So if your car is in reverse and you're at this position and then you go in the negative direction, or if your ball is at a certain height and it drops, then your displacement is negative, okay? But what we care about now is what's the velocity? How fast is it moving? And the easiest way to think about velocity, first of all, is to think of it in terms of average velocity, which is distance over time, right? Rate is distance over time, miles per hour. How many miles did you travel in so many hours? So in this notation, that would be change in S over change in time. But that looks like F of A plus H because of Delta S is up here, minus F of A over how much time has changed if I've gone from A to A plus H? It's just H. You can think of it as A plus H minus A, but that just gives you H. So this is average velocity. We're gonna use this formula right here for if I write it as V, I may put a V sub AVE for average. And just a side note, speed, right, is different than velocity. Velocity has to do with the uh, direction you're going as well, right? So like if I was going 60 miles per hour, that means I'm going forward at 60 miles per hour. If I'm going negative 10 miles per hour, I'm going that way. But speed is the concept we give to just the magnitude of the velocity. In, in you know, the second case, I'm still going 10 miles per hour. I'm just going in, in a different direction. My speed is 10. My velocity is negative 10. Okay. So velocity has direction associated with it. Generally, that's the concept. But speed is just the absolute value of the velocity average. It's the same formula. Just put it in absolute value. That's the speed it is, you can write it out if you want to, f of a plus h minus f of a over h. Okay, so I'll tell you what we're going to do. Um, because we have like class to, to 1050, let me do this example to finish this page. And then we'll take about a 10 minute break. Right, get up, stretch our legs, wander around so you don't have to sit for two hours. And then we'll come back and we'll do um, the last example I want us to work on together. I want you to actually do some of the calculations yourself on the last example because it's in your homework. Let's, let's finish this page and then we'll take a quick break. Okay, So this shouldn't take all that long, but let's do this example um, from your homework and we'll do it together. And then the second example we'll do kind of on our own, but we'll check our answers together. So we've got the ball being thrown into the air. Okay. And we say it's thrown into the air with an average velocity of 34 feet per second. When that happens, we know that the formula, the height in feet t seconds later is given by this. Okay, so think about what you've been given here. You saw that they told you some information about this velocity of 34 feet per second, but really what they're just doing is setting the context of the problem and telling you this is the formula we're going to work with. If you were taking physics this semester, then one of your problems you'll learn in that class is if I tell you what the initial velocity is and the units, you can figure out this formula. 
were in calculus. I'm not going to make you figure out the formula. I just gave it to you. Okay. So this other stuff here is just extra information we don't need. We're going to use this. So we want to find the average velocity for the time period beginning when t is 2. So this is in seconds. t is in seconds. So after 2 seconds and lasting for each of the following. So I'm going to do this two times. First of all, let's say we last for 0.5 seconds. So we want to know what was the average velocity between t equals 2 seconds and t equals 0.5 seconds later. So how do we find average velocity? So it's displacement or distance over time. Okay, and how do we find displacement? You can just go straight to the formula, but think even in terms of what these actually mean is helpful. But here's the formula right here, right? So let's just think about what is, uh, first of all, what's A in this problem? It's the two. It's where we're starting, right? And then what's the H in this problem? It's how much time has elapsed. Yeah, which is the 0.5. You're right. So F of, so A plus H would be 2 plus 0.5 or 2.5 minus F at A, which is 2, divided by 0 0.5, which is my H. So this is my H and this is my A. A just means the starting time. H is how much time has gone by. Now, how do I figure out F of 2.5? What is F in this problem? Right here, Y is equal to F of T. So that's my F right here. So I'm going to just write it all nice and big, first of all. And I'm going to put 2.5 into this formula. So 34 times 2.5 minus 16 times 2.5 squared, okay, and then minus, that's this minus here, f of 2. So I'm going to take the same thing and plug 2 into it, 34 times 2 minus 16 times 2 squared. All of this divided by 0 0.5. Go. I want my calculator. It's not letting me run my calculator. Weird. Did I even bring a calculator? I did not. Calculator app. Open. And it closes. What the heck? I'm crashing my calculator. All right, I guess I'll have to do a browser calculator or something. Um, we'll go to work. Not the best place, but it'll work. Okay, so I had to do 34 times 2.5 minus 16 times 2.5 squared minus 34 times 2 minus 16 times 2 squared. So I'm getting negative 19 on top. Over 0.5, which gives me a negative 38. Dividing by a half is the same thing as multiplying by 2. So 38 feet per second. That's the average velocity that it was traveling. That's just a matter of getting that plugged into your calculator. Cool. All right. What if we reduce the amount of time that has passed? 0.05. The formula will look very similar. But now instead of being 2 plus 0.5, it's 2 plus 0.05, 2.05. 
still minus the starting time divided by 0 0.05. which you can write all the way out again if you need to. Um, I do know, I think, well, I'll just write it out. 34, 2.05 minus 16 times 2.05 squared minus 34 times two minus 16 times two squared divided by 0.05 now. All right, I'm going to leave this screen, but hopefully you see what I was doing. I was just plugging in the 2.05. So if I go back here, I'm going to actually add that I'm dividing by. You don't have to use Wolfram Alpha. Hopefully you know how to use your calculator. But if you need some help practicing, I will let you come see me. I'm plugging in now 34 times 2.05 minus 16 times 2.05 squared minus then 34 times 2 minus 16 times 2 squared, all divided by 0 0.05. And I get negative 30.08 when I do that. Feet per second. So now, suppose we want to not computer, but compute. Suppose we want to compute the average velocity over shorter and shorter time intervals. A to A plus H. In other words, we're going to let H go to zero. Okay, get closer and closer and closer to two. So instead of letting 0.05 seconds go by, let's let 0.01 seconds go by. Maybe 0 0.001, 0 0.00001. Okay, as H approaches zero, then we're going to call the velocity that it gets close to. That right at that instant, that's instantaneous velocity. V of A at time T equals A will be the limit as H goes to zero of F of A plus H minus F of A over H. Now we don't know how to actually do limits yet. That's coming. We just know that this means let H get smaller and smaller and see what happens to this fraction. Now we've done two values on this one, right? We kind of did that on the previous page when we saw um, 6, 7, 6.5, 6.1, 6.01, we saw it was getting closer to six. It's a little harder with just two values, negative 38, negative 30.08. I went ahead and threw this question in even though I don't have a good answer from just those two values because you're gonna do this in your homework and you're actually gonna do a couple more values past these and see what they look like. Okay. okay, so in this example, what we're asked to do is, uh, we're gonna look at the, the, the word problem that says the flash unit on a camera operates by storing a charge on a capacitor, and it releases it suddenly when the flash is set off. So the data that we're provided is here in this, uh, in this table. Uh, let me switch to this, this table right there. And um, the Q is the charge remaining on the capacitor. So we're going to measure that in microcoulombs at time t, where t is measured in seconds. We're going to use that data to draw a graph of the function. So that actually is already provided for us with this red curve going down right here. We're going to want to estimate the slope of the tangent line where t is equal to 0.04. So t equals 0.04 is right there. Okay. So we want to estimate the slope of the tangent line at that exact point. Okay, so I'm going to walk through how this problem is going to set that up. We, we don't have the formula for the function to do this, but we do have enough data. So let's let P be the point right here, and that is at 0 0.04, 67.05, and R is the point 0, 0.00, that's this first point right here, so this is R and this right here we're calling P. I want to find the slope of the line um, that goes through those two points. Okay, so this right here being the point R. What's the slope of the line that goes through this? So M sub P R. Okay, now we remember that the slope is the change in Y over the change in X. So we can do this as 100 minus 67.05 over 0.00 over, uh, sorry, minus 0.0. .00 
4. Okay, so plug that into my calculator. I'm going to get negative 824, uh, and the units on top is micro coulombs. And the units on bottom is seconds, so negative 824 microcoulombs per second. That would be the slope of the line that goes from R through P. Okay, now that's not exactly what the tangent of the line is. That's a secant line, right? So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to fill in the rest of the table. We're going to find the slope of the line if we change where R is. So instead of going from, say, P to R, which is what we just got, this negative 824, what if R was 0 0.02, 81.86? So still find M sub P R, but now change what R is. So instead of using 100 and 0, we're going to use 81.86 minus 67.05 and 0 0.02 minus 0 0.04. And I'm going to plug that into my calculator, and I'm going to get negative 741 whenever I subtract the top and divide it by negative 0.02 on bottom, because that's what I get when I subtract the bottom. I get negative 741 there. Okay. Again, what I'm doing is I'm using the point here is the point P, and here is the point R. That's the change in Y over the change in X. It's giving me the slope. Okay, so what if now I change R one more time? What is the slope between the points P and R if R is this point now? Okay, so again, looking at the values, I just did the point here was now R. That is the line that went through those two points. Now what if this right here was my R? Okay, that's the point 0.06, uh, 54.89. So 54.89 minus 67.05, because it's still the same P, and then 0 0.06 minus 0 0.04, okay? So you subtract the top, subtract the bottom, divide, I actually get negative 607.5, negative 607.5, okay? So the question that you want to ask yourself is, which one of those maybe were the best? possible approximation, because they're all three different numbers. What is the exact slope of the tangent that goes through the point P? None of those are exactly right. Which one would be maybe the closest? And it's really hard to say. I mean, this one right here um, is a little steeper than probably. This one's a little shallower right here than probably. Um, R, um, if we go back to the very beginning, one is e even uh, steeper than the first one. So another thing that we could possibly do is what if we took this slope and this slope and averaged them together and maybe get what is about halfway in between those two. So that's what C asks us to do is if this was R and this was R, we got two different slopes. Let's average those two slopes. Let's average these two numbers to get another way of approximating what that slope is. Now, what do I mean by average? I mean add them up and divide by 2. Okay, so that's negative 607.5 plus negative 741 all divided by 2. Okay, that gives me negative 674.25 microcoulombs per second as an approximation of maybe what that slope of that tangent line would be.